this morning. Um, uh, welcome everyone once again. Uh, thank you so much for greeting our pastor with your own languages at work. I have um, um, a friend, he's a security guard. And every time as I park my car, he will always, I will always wait for him to greet me in his own language because I like to respond in his language than for me to greet him. So he will always say Dimacheroni, and then I will say Dimacheroni Abu Di Ah. And then he will say, what I like when he responds is da. I like that. So is the, the, that's how beautiful our African languages are. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Today is the Mission Monday. We are all being called to serve and to call everyone to the kingdom because it won't be nice to be in the kingdom with all these different languages and when our neighbors, when um, our friends and families are not part uh, of, the, of, the, of the great uh, uh, mission that God has all called us to do. What a privilege to work for God. Um, this morning, Pastor, I welcome you and uh, may you take the podium as we are listening attentively to the word of God. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that welcome. And I thank you so much for your greetings. Um, if I was in Zambia, particularly the southern part, I'd probably say Mwabukabuti, and uh, in Kosa, I'd say Molweni. Um, I hope we have all woken up well this morning and um, are ready for God's blessing upon us and for him <clears throat> to speak to us. Uh, excuse my voice this morning. I did a lot of uh, preaching yesterday. I had a funeral and uh, yeah, it's been a busy weekend. But anyways, uh, but God is still good. This morning, we are going to continue with our messages. And we want to look at the big picture this morning. And um, turn with me in your Bibles to chapter 12 and verse 17. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Revelation 12, verse 17. Uh, the Bible actually says, the Bible says here, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of his seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So here the Bible tells us of the wrath of the dragon. Of course, chapter 12, traces the controversy or the great controversy. It begins with the great controversy as Jesus was coming upon the earth and then peels back the curtain a little bit into the past um, and shows us the war that took place in heaven that led to the casting out of the dragon, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. And here, friends, you will notice that the word dragon as it is used for Satan it is used for Satan as he persecutes um, God's people. For example, in verse um, three, uh, and ver actually in verse, in, in verse four, the Bible say, tells us that the dragon stands before the woman in order to devour the child as soon as it is born. In verse 13, the Bible tells us that when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he went and persecuted the woman um, which brought forth the man child. And then lastly, in verse 17, it says that the dragon goes to make war with the remnant of her seed. So here we see that the dragon devours, the dragon persecutes, and the dragon makes war. And we know that the expression makes war, in according to chapter 13 and verse 5, make war is actually another expression that is used for persecution when God's people, oh, sorry, this is chapter 13, verse seven, not verse five, verse seven. So when God's people are being persecuted by the satanic forces, the Bible uses the term make war. So we learn here in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, that God is going to actually fight against the people of God. And the reason why he is fighting against them is for two reasons. Number one, 
He's fighting against them because they are keeping the commandments of God. That's one of the reasons why he hates God's people. And secondly, he fights against them and he actually hates them because they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Remember, friends, that even in chapter one, John was in the Isle of Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So we see here that Satan has been consistent in the ages and fighting against those who are calling people back to the commandments of God. He is fighting against those who are actually calling people back to the word of God. Um, Satan hates God's people at the end of time because of what they are standing against. Now, in chapter 12, verse 17, the Bible does not tell us how Satan is going to actually make war with God's people. But in chapter 13, the Bible tells us very clearly, first of all, you have the first beast um, from verse 1 in chapter 13 all the way to verse 10, the first beast of Revelation. And you see there how Satan in the past has made war with his people through the first beast, uh, which we believe uh, represents uh, the papacy. Uh, together, friends, there are many identifying marks. We don't have time to go through that in this presentation. Um, but you will see as you look closer at the second beast that it actually represents the papacy. And then in verse 11 to verse 18, now it speaks about the second beast, which actually helps and, 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 and is the chief agent in the healing of the deadly wound of the first beast in also bringing the first beast again into prominence and actually leading the world back into the worship of the first beast. And then it says here in verse 15, the Bible says, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, notice that according to this verse, the way that Satan is going to actually make war with God's people is through the formation of the image of the beast. Of course, a, an image is a likeness to something. So what the first beast did, the second beast is going to do something like it. All right. Now, of course, when we study the first beast, you will notice that it was a religious political power or you can even say crystal political power. And number two, it was a power that um, actually used the political power to enact religious laws. And number three, those who defected from those religious laws were actually persecuted through the use of the state power. So the state power was used in order to elevate religious teachings. And, 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 and now also those who defected or who did not obey those religious teachings, they were actually persecuted and killed. Now we start to understand why in the introduction to this beast, the second beast, it says it had two lamb-like horns, yet it spake as a dragon. How does the dragon speak? According, uh, of course, when we go back to chapter to chapter, uh, uh, to chapter 12, and, and, and we go back to the dragon, we see that the dragon devours, the dragon persecutes, and the dragon makes war with God's people. And therefore, we can understand that this uh, second beast is going to actually make war with God's people, it's going to persecute God's people, it's going to make laws that are going to lead to the persecution of God's people. And verse 15 makes it very clear, abundantly clear, that through the setting up of the image of the beast, through the enactment of, um, of, of the mark of the beast, which represents the Sunday laws, which will be put out by legislation. And friends, we're actually in the process of that happening right now. And I'm not saying this to be sensationalist. I'm not saying this to actually um, scare people. I'm telling you what is exactly happening throughout the world. There is a push both in evangelical Protestant America and in Catholic uh, Europe, there is a serious push for Sunday laws. And in even countries where you would actually not expect this to happen in Caribbean islands, there is a push 
for Sunday laws. And I'm, we're going to talk about that, of course, when we're talking about the third angel's message. But it's, all of this is going to, of course, be in snapshots because we don't have the time to delve into it in much detail. But the point that I'm trying to make with this is that Satan is actually galvanizing his forces. He's actually working through his forces to prepare and to consolidate. Um, Ellen White, when she speaks in volume nine of the testimonies, she says that you know, the evil agencies are actually working and consolidating and the final movements will be rapid ones. Um, God's people, we are living in a dangerous time. And Satan is actually working and he's bringing together his forces. And we are being told that the final movements will be rapid ones. A lot of us are caught in this slumber. And we, we, we tell ourselves that we have a lot of time to work with, that there's, a, there's, there's plenty of time and, and we can just relax. We don't have to be too hectic about these issues of prophecy. We don't have to agitate these issues among God's people. We should not be alarmists. We should not be uh, sensationalists. We should not be conspiracy theorists. You know, those are all terms that Satan is using to, to actually uh, lead us to relax. Now, I'm not saying that we should be fanatical and, 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 and to be alarmist as well. I'm not saying that we should be living on the edge uh, of our seats and be constantly in fear are we together because God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. There is no fear in God, the Bible says. Um, so, oh, and, and the love of God casts out fear. So, so, so friends, I'm not saying that we should be scared and shaking in our boots because of this. Actually, chapter 14 now tells us this is where the, 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 the three angels message comes in. The three angels message comes in to assure us that God is seeing what is happening and God has a battle plan and a strategy for his people to face and to prepare to face what is coming upon the world, friends. And, and, and the first thing that God does in chapter 14, I love God for this. In chapter 14, verse one to five, God assures us that there are those who are going to be victorious against these forces of the, of the first beast and the second beast and their combined work and the work of the mark of the beast and the setting up of the image of the beast. God shows us that there is going to be a people that will be victorious. Why? Because we see this group of people who are seen standing on Mount Zion, who have been delivered by the Lamb, and who stand as specimens of those who will remain faithful to God. They do not have the mark of the beast in their foreheads. They don't have the name of the beast in their foreheads. They don't have the number of the beast in their foreheads, but they have their father's name written in their foreheads. They do not reflect um, the, 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 the characteristics of the beast, but they have the character of Jesus. The image of Jesus has been perfectly reproduced in these people. They bear the image of Jesus. The same words that are spoken in 1 Peter chapter 2 um, about Jesus, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, are actually used to describe these people. The Bible says, and in their mouth was found no guile for they are without fault before the throne of God. Therefore, the words that are spoken by Zechariah in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 13, that the remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, but they shall feed and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. So friends, before we enter into this war, God has told us already that we have won the war by his grace and through his power. So this is the powerful thing that we find in Revelation chapter 14. And the second thing that you see in the second section of Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, and all the way to verse 12, is that God has a strategy. Now, the, the, the result of the three angels' messages is produced in, 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 or is shown in verses 1 to 5, the result. Now, in, 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 in verse 6 to verse 12, it actually gives us the detail of the message that has produced these people that we find in verses 1 to 5. And then verses um, 13 all the way to the end shows us now the harvest 
that will take place after the preaching of the three angels' messages and the work of the three angels' messages has done its work in the lives of God's people. So praise the Lord that God has given us this big picture. And to show you the relation of the three angels' messages to, the, to, to Satan's battle plan, um, Look at, in, in verse six, for example, the, the, the first angel's message says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. Now, the first thing is that we are called to fear God. We see that the forces of the first and second beast in Revelation chapter 13 are actually trying to induce fear in the world. Are we together, friends? They are trying to induce fear among those who are following God so that they can fear. That is why there's threats that you cannot buy or sell save those who have the mark of the beast. And by the way, friends, this is why I'm very careful when it comes to this issue of vaccine mandates. And by the way, I'm not saying vaccine mandates are the mark of the beast, or I'm not saying that. So please don't say Pastor Posa said vaccine mandates are the mark of the beast. I'm not saying that. But if we begin to make laws that are dictating who it can go where and when, and who can buy and who can sell, we need to be very careful as students of prophecy. We need to have our antennas up and say, okay, if this thing is followed to its logical conclusion, what can it lead to? What does it have a potential to lead to? And friends, it's not only Seventh-day Adventists who are studying prophecy, who are seeing the tyranny that these issues can lead to. So by the way, I just wanted to say that as a side issue, that we should not take some things lightly when they happen. Because the next thing that we are going to fight against after we are finished with the coronavirus is global warming. And one of the main suggestions that we have received from the men of sin himself is that one way that we can fight against global warming is by instituting Sunday laws to actually bring back the sacredness of Sunday to give the earth rest on Sunday. And this encyclical of Laudato Si was received warmly by the leaders of the world, friends. So, but we're going to get back to that when we're speaking about the third angel's message. I just wanted to, to throw that in. But here, friends, we see that the, the, the first and second beast, especially through the second beast and its work, the, the Satan's forces are trying to instill fear into the world. But the first angel's message says, no, 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 no. Don't fear the beast. Fear God. Now, if you look in the, in the, in the first, in, in Revelation 13, again, what the second, the, the second beast says, actually, the, the, the first bit, what is said about the first beast is, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with the beast? So you see that there is this glorification of the first beast. So in chapter 13, you have this glorification of the first beast, but the Bible says, now nah -uh. give glory to God. Do not glorify the beast glorify God. And now you see also in Revelation chapter 13 that the Bible says the whole world wandered after the beast. The whole world worshiped the beast. Worship. The word worship actually is used eight times, eight times in Revelation chapter 13. The word worship is used eight times, but now by the way, a beast is a creature, a created thing. Now, the Bible in first angel's message says, no, 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 do not worship the creature. Worship him who created the heavens and the earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. But by the way, you will see that even this is militating against the mark of the beast, which is the false Sabbath that was instituted by the men of sin. But when we are called to worship the creator, we are called to observance of the day that God has given as a memorial of his creation which is the sabbath friends so now after god has told you, now there is a judgment that takes place in revelation chapter 13 the judgment is if anyone does not worship the image of the beast they should be killed now you see here that God says, no, 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 no. The hour of God's judgment has come. So you need to make sure that you are on God's side, even though you are standing against these forces, God is judging as well. And there are going to be results to God's judgment. So don't fear the beast, fear God. Don't glorify the beast, glorify God. Don't worship the beast, worship the creator. Uh, uh, uh. Do not worry about the judgment of the beast because the hour of judgment of God's judgment is here. God is investigating. God is actually the one who is at work judging. And then the Bible tells us also that 
Now, now, now we are warned against the fall of Babylon. We're told Babylon has fallen. Why? Because these movements of Revelation 13 are actually, uh, are actually being concocted by people who call themselves Christian. Are we together, friends? These are people who are supposedly Christian powers. But God says, no, 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 do not be mistaken. This is not representing me. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. That great city, why? Because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So what leads us to the Sunday laws is the false doctrines and dogmas of Babylon. So we are warned against the fall of Babylon. These are the result of the concoction of the doctrines of the fallen churches of both Catholicism and Protestantism. And lastly, we are given a warning now. If any man worships the beast and his image and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So you have two things to choose between. The wrath of the dragon on the wrath of the land, the wrath of Satan or the wrath of God. Which one would you rather face? This is the story of the three angels' messages. That is why it goes out as a warning to the whole world so that if you choose to fear the wrath of the dragon and receive the mark of the beast, know that you are going to face the wrath of God. And therefore God tells us the story before it happens so that we can make sure that we make the right choice. But let me tell you again, friends, the next thing that we see is the harvest of the righteous, the harvest of the earth. When Jesus is coming the second time, we have seen in the beginning of the chapter that there will be those who will be victorious, who will stand with the lamb, on Mount Zion because Jesus will have delivered them from the wrath of the dragon. And again, we see the harvest of the righteous after the giving of the strangers' messages. God says, stand on my side. And the question that I have for you today and for me to meditate on is which star side will we be found standing? May God find us standing on his side, friends. Let us close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Thank you so much for showing us these things before they come to pass so that when they come to pass, we may know that you are God. Please be with us. You have not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. There's no fear in God. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. May you cast out our fears as we study these prophecies, Lord. And may we know and understand that you are in control and that you are going to bring us victorious at the end only if we remain at your feet. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. Help us to remain focused. Help us to be engaged in your mission. Help us to take this message of hope and love and spread it across the world under the power of the Holy Spirit, not by might, nor by power, but by thy spirit. For we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.